Admiral Bobby Ray Inman is a retired United States Navy Admiral who held several influential positions within the United States intelligence community. This included becoming the Director of Naval Intelligence, the Director of the NSA, the Director of the National Underwater Reconnaissance Office, Deputy Director of the CIA, and Vice Director of the DIA. In 1981, Admiral Inman was operating as both the Director of the NSA and the Deputy Director of the CIA simultaneously. Amongst his other positions, he's been a Chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, a Director on the Board for Science Applications International Corporation, and has since made a success investing in the technology sector. He is a man who has spent the majority of his career at the absolute top of the intelligence community hierarchy and it was a privilege to have an opportunity to speak with him and to hear his ideas on a whole multitude of issues. And so without further delay, here is my conversation with Admiral Bobby Ray Inman. I think on the bottom line of a wonderful line, is a willingness to take risk, to undertake things where I wasn't sure I knew everything I needed to know to be successful at it, um, and to have benefited from an incredible array of mentors who opened doors for me, who helped things along. I try to respond by doing that now which is one of the reasons for accepting your invitation to dialogue. I'm a, I was rushed through school, went to high school at 11, started college at 15, started at Tyler Junior College, transferred uh, as a junior to a four year, graduated from the University of Texas in June of 1950, uh, just after I turned 19. Taught school for a year, went back to continue graduate studies in the field of history. And at that point, I found I was about to be drafted. So I scrambled, talked to both the Air Force and the Navy. Navy came through first. I went to officer candidate school in November 1951, commissioned in March 50. Two, uh, barely still before my 21st birthday. Aircraft carrier, uh, duty in Europe, Paris, London, cruiser in the Pacific, postgraduate school turned out to be something called naval intelligence. The rest of the Navy's postgraduate school was in beautiful Monterey, California. The intelligence course was taught in Anacostia, in the District of Columbia. But out of that, uh, I ended up in the Pentagon and a couple of flukes ended up as a briefer for the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Arleigh Byrd, great World War II hero. And he became my mentor for, uh, you know, long after he'd retired, I, I did not realize he was still playing a role when I was a flag officer. And uh, I was sort of bragging about how things had gone without outside interference. And Chief of Naval Personnel told me that was nonsense, that I had been, the worst case, Admiral Burke would call up every two or three months and ask, where's Inman going next? And they'd tell him, he said, no, that guy's not tough enough. I'm willing to work for somebody who's harder. <laughs> um, from the briefing job to a destroyer, promoted early um, and got approached by the ranking Naval Intelligence Specialist, General Sam Frankel, applied and became a uh, restricted line intelligence specialist. Uh, came back to a job in an office the Navy had at the National Security Agency. Tracking the Soviet Navy beginning to be a blue water Navy operating away from coastal waters. That led to deep involvement in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, eventually, 
when I was going to leave that job, uh, I was told I was going to go to an attaché post and going to Indonesia. And suddenly those orders were changed and I was going to Stockholm. Very welcome news for my wife because we had a, a small child. Um, but it turned out Swedes had asked for help in understanding what they were collecting on the Soviet Navy in the Baltic. So I replaced a Marine as assistant naval attaché. Um, still kept up the liaison duties with the Coast Artillery, the equivalent U.S. Marines. And but a couple of days a week, I'd put on civilian clothes, use my Swedish Ministry of Defense badge, and go play analyst. I loved it. We had some good successes. So I did all of the social stuff that attaches have to do, but also kept involved in subsidy intelligence. Went from there halfway across the world to be head of an current intelligence for the U.S. Pacific Fleet based in Hawaii. Um, 21 months later, out to be the seventh fleet intelligence officer down in the combat zone every month for two and a half years, three vice chiefs, three, I'm sorry, three seventh fleet commanders. Back to Washington National War College, pulled out of intelligence to be the executive assistant to the Navy's vice chief. First time they'd ever put a restricted line officer in one of those boards. Because the executive assistants to Secretary of the Navy, Under Secretary of the Navy, Chief of Naval Operations, Vice Chief of Naval Operations are considered grooming spots for potential, for captains who could be potentially three or four star officers later on. Um, coming out of the Naval War Co National War College, Executive Assistant Vice Chief, as I indicated, three vice chiefs. In 18 months, then off to Hawaii to be assistant chief staff for intelligence. Month after we got there, to my great shock, news that I had been picked up very early for a first star. Um, on one July, my third vice chief, Admiral John Holloway, moved up to be the CNO, and he brought me back in September to be the director of naval intelligence. Um, normally you do one or two flag officer jobs before becoming DNI. Um, time of a uh, lot going on, the end of Vietnam, trying to reorient forces to uh, current problems, future problems, and congressional investigations into alleged abuses intelligence community previous 25 years. I, when I was in the vice chief's office as the executive assistant, I had one of my daily tasks was to monitor how the Navy writ large had done in its relationship with Congress from constituent relationship to testimony to authorization appropriations and to track media relations. Um, so when I got back to be the DNI and the congressional committee started, I knew how important the staffs were. So I met the staffs coming to look at what the Navy could have been involved in, read the same files they read, talked about what we found, no disagreement about fact, sometimes disagreement about what it meant. But the end result was I was the first one ready to testify before the Senate committee, the church committee. Um, closed session, it went well. Did the House committee closed session, it went well. None of my peers had ever dealt with Congress. They didn't meet the staffs. They didn't read the files staffs ran. 
they began testimony in the open hearings, being surprised by paper coming out of their files. Um, the ranking Republicans, both Senate and the House, would see President Ford, said you got to do something there, destroying the intelligence community. And as he later related to me, President Ford asked, was well, that going right? And I said, well, those hearings with a young uh, Naval Director of Naval Intelligence have gone well. Next question, do they trust him? They said, well, we do. And we'll go back to the chairman of committees. Next time there's a flap, have Inman come, read the files, brief the committee in closed session, what he thinks it means. Did a lot of that over the next six months. While I was trying to run a 3,600 person organization, Office Naval Intelligence. And when it was all over, I had very strong support, both sides of the aisle, both houses of Congress. Um, President Ford fired Dr. Schlesinger as Secretary of Defense, he got tired of being lectured and sent Don Rumsfeld to be the new Secretary of Defense, who on his first day fired the leadership of the Defense Intelligence Agency. The director went out to be a loud public opponent. The vice director reverted to two stars and went out to be the director of intelligence for the Strategic Air Command. They had a wise old Army three-star the OSD staff, Sam Wilson, who became the new director, and the flap was who would be the vice director. President Ford intervened, and I got promoted from one start at three to be the vice director of DIA. Then he lost the election. Uh, a lot of curiosity about what would happen. Uh, new administration, to my great surprise, uh, I was selected to be the director of the National Security Agency with a very strong support of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General George Brown Air Force, and the chief staff of the Air Force, General David Jones. They wanted to bring Gene Tai back from SAC to be the director of the IA. And uh, NSA was a bigger job, so I was thrilled with the outcome, uh, had 44 wonderful months as director of NSA, planned to retire, got shanghai by the new administration, largely because of the combined pressure of Senator Barry Goldwater and Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, chair and vice chair of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence at that point. Um, I had declined the offer to go be the deputy director three times. The day after inauguration, Secretary came in and said, the President's calling. I figured it was President Carter following up on getting hostages out of Iran. <laughs> it was the President. Could have been more charming. I've met him once before several years earlier. And he went through the whole routine, why he had selected Bill Casey to be the ECI, the pressure from Bill Water and Moynihan, and my turning him down. And then came the inescapable phrase, now Admiral, we're in office and speaking as your commander in chief. I need you. I want you to serve as Bill Casey's deputy. Under the circumstances, Mr. President, I'd be honored, but hopefully in the more than 18 months to two years. He agreed to that, and that set the term. I stayed 18 months as deputy director, came to the private sector. A lot of publicity when I left government, a lot of offers for some great jobs. I settled on the least lucrative, but the most unusual putting together a consortium uh, 
owned by 15 competing computer and semiconductor companies to compete with the Japanese on fifth generation of computing. <clears throat> the, um, then a nationwide site selection of where to put it, 50 cities in 27 states bid, Austin won, and that's how I ended up back in Austin after um, 30 some odd years from the time I graduated from UT. Was great choice. Did that for four years, did a leverage buyout for three. Uh, served on a number of large multinational corporate boards and not for profit boards, and got interested in venture capital. Some fortunate early successes. So I also was approached pro bono to team teach a graduate course at the University of Texas, Austin, on how government works. Uh, Bob Strauss, John Connolly, Charles Walker, myself. Um, pro bono, uh, but it was fun, uh, just teaching four classes in the semester. Eight years along, Connolly became terminally ill, Strauss went off to Moscow. Charlie Walker and I kept it going. I was suddenly doing eight classes, not four. And then Charlie's health was failing. And I was saying, why am I doing this? When to my utter surprise, I was often tenure, full professor, flagship chair, the Lyndon Johnson Centennial Chair in National Policy, whose only previous occupant had been Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. Um, 20 years, served twice as the interim dean, not willingly. Um, and stepped down from that one, 31 August, uh, 2021. Um, it's been a great run. Um, I will be 91 in a couple of weeks. Um, the body is clearly showing the signs of aging. The mind is still holding up pretty well. Now that that long winded run through the career, uh, I turn the floor back over to you. <laughs> well, I really appreciate that uh, that background, and it was it was very enjoyable to listen. What a unique life uh, that you have lived. Honestly, it's 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 fascinating. Having a little trouble hearing you, Jay. Oh, um, is that better? Is that better? Oh, okay, sorry about that. It's a new microphone. I'm still figuring out how close I need to be to it. Um, but yeah, so that was, thank you so much for that. Really, really enjoyed listening to that backstory and. Such a fascinating, unique career path. How how has your career impacted the way that you look at the world, especially the way that you look at geopolitical relations today? Uh, what do you see the current state of global power dynamics taking us in the future? Where do you see us going? In my senior year of high school, public high school in the small town, Manila, Texas, Amy Willis taught the civics class that I took. And we used to argue, and she, and she really baited me to, because I was more conservative than most of my friends at that point in deeply uh, democratic East Texas. Um, that spread my interest in how government works and then go get to the Navy, to avoid being drafted, ended up dramatically expanding my interest in the world. When they sent me to that Naval Intelligence postgraduate class, a very uh, biased professor uh, taught the class the whole nine months on geography. But we went into great detail, culture, history, religion, ethnic, as of every spot on the globe. And that grounding has served me enormously through the whole, all the multiple careers that have followed uh, in the process. 
which has, has led me to understand how the study of geography and of culture and the histories helps you understand what could happen again in the process. Um, so I guess for explaining where my interest in tracking what was going on in the outside world occurred, that's it. Uh, one more sea story. Uh, I had just gotten to the Pentagon after the intelligence postgraduate course. And I was on the task force supporting the crisis that followed the coup in Iraq in 58 and then following the Taiwan Straits. And uh, Admiral Burke began his day with a 30 minute briefing. All the admirals in the Navy Department, a few captains there. Um, 10 minutes of intelligence of the outside world, 10 minutes on US naval operations, 10 minutes on congressional relations, media relations, weather. Uh, no scripts, fan brief, sit down. The commander briefing at the end of uh, August gave him an inaccurate, inaccurate information answer to a question. He ordered the Seventh Fleet moved, but as of 1 July, he no longer had operational control. So he went to get the Joint Chiefs to ratify it, found he'd acted on the inaccurate info, fired Commander Massey. For Saturday morning, when he had no schedule, question, um, not to call back one of the other briefers, but put on a substitute. Director of Naval Intelligence put Lieutenant Inman on. And when Burke came in, saw how nervous I was, asked a question where he ever sat down. But I got nervous all over again, because as I would brief on a country, he'd ask me about every country around it. And we toured the world for 25 minutes. And he turned with a great flourish and said, leave the lieutenant on the briefing team as Commander Manson's successor. And my whole life changed from that moment. Um, but again, it was that deep study of geography and history that in, gave, enabled me to respond to his interest in all the countries that were around the world. One other sea story I would share with you from that two years, I got a call from Admiral Burke on Friday afternoon asking what I was doing that weekend. Well, I'll be in the office on Saturday and at home on Sunday. Would it be convenient for you to come in for a while Sunday afternoon? Certainly. His guest was Lord Louis Mountbatten, the first sea lord of the Royal Navy. That was one of the most incredible three hours. I would brief on a country and they both talk about their knowledge of it in the process. So I think you can understand out of all of this where my interest in affairs in the world uh, expanded and where I was instructed to think strategically, to look at beyond just what's happening today Next week, what could be happening? What might be the result of these two or three years later? And I fortunately have carried that strategic outlook through the multiple careers that have followed. How, how do you how do you feel about the World Economic Forum? Because this is this is an organization that seems to be acting as a, uh, I suppose, a transnational structure comprised of people that haven't necessarily been elected by any sort of democratic process, but are nevertheless heavily influencing governments across the world and, and representing the interests of the most powerful 0.1% of the global elite. Um, can I get your thoughts on the agenda of the World Economic Forum and, and how you feel about organizations such as this? It's an interesting forum for uh, wealthy people and uh, sometimes present foreign government people to get together to share views and bask in their own self-importance. <laughs> uh, I served for four years 
as the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, not a single time did we ever talk about the World Economic Forum or what was happening in trying to understand the U.S. economy and where it was going. Um, when we brought MCC, the Joint Research Venture, to Austin in 83, the rest of the country was very surprised that we didn't end up in uh, Silicon Valley or Boston. And it was the beginning of the high-tech boom in Austin. Now, Austin is now the 11th largest city in the U.S. There's a steady stream, about 100 a day, of new arrivals, uh, technology execs and all. Leon, um, Elon Musk now operates out of here in South Texas in his multiple enterprises. Uh, Oracle's headquarters have moved here. Google, Apple, you know, all have built large headquarters here. Not once has the World Economic Forum had any influence on that at all. So, it, you know, it's fun to get together with people of like backgrounds to share views and think what goes on in the world. But does Davos really impact what goes on in the world after that meeting and two good headlines, in my view, the answer is no. I sincerely hope you're right. Because <laughs> they make me a little nervous, to be honest. Quite a dystopian uh, image of the world that I, uh, I see coming from the World Economic Forum. So uh, I do hope you're correct on that. What, what do you see as the most prominent and, and globally significant uh, issues or threats uh, right now? Well, let's divide it into two different dimensions. First, the Russian war on Ukraine is going to end up dramatically changing world events. It now takes us back to a Cold War slant hot war in the process. I would remind you this is the first invasion across international borders um, the, the, in Western Europe. The only ones that have occurred since World War II uh, have been Russia. Chechnya was part of Russia. Um, the next one was Georgia. That was not part of it, but a former part of the Soviet Union. Then Crimea, former part of the Soviet Union. And now the Ukraine. And it's Putin's determination to rebuild a greater Russia. I'm not going to call it Soviet Union. It'll be called Russia. But to have the non-Muslim territories back as part of the great Slavic nation in the process. And the issue in front of us is how far do those ambitions go? Uh, clearly, the Ukraine has gone much slower than he anticipated and much greater fight. That's not going to change his ambitions. And once he has subjugated Ukraine, what's next? Is it Moldova? Um, is it the Baltic Republics? And um, I'm not comfortable that he's averse to taking on NATO directly. The fact that he raised the specter of raising status of his nuclear forces early in this war says he is to, he's willing to gamble high and calling the bluff of the West. What he has achieved is a unification of NATO and the European Union that I thought was not possible. Uh, and the UK, having left Brexit, suddenly is now back very much uh, in tune. So that's the reaction on that side. The other is the economic competition. And there we've got the European Union as the largest. We have the Canada, the US, Mexico, Canada agreement that replaced NAFTA. We have the ASEAN agreement, Southeast Asia, which has been very successful for a very long time now. Mercosur and 
South America, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, not as successful. Asia was the big unknown. Trans-Pacific Partnership was to have uh, filled that void and then President Trump elected to withdraw the U.S. participation. Japan held it together, it's gone forward. Um, but the dramatic growth of China, beginning with Deng Xiaoping's decisions in 78 to unleash the entrepreneurial spirit of the Chinese people and to tell them they can leave the party and go get wealthy. And they did in very large numbers. Um, and the Chinese economy grew at an astonishing rate um, to be the second largest economy in the world. China is now about to embark in November on a departure from the political stability that Deng Xiaoping left behind. No one serving more than 10 years. She will in November be elected to begin a third five-year term as the Secretary General of the party and chairman of the military commission. And the following March as president for another five-year term. And with concentration of power uh, unseen since the days of Chairman Mao. Um, determined to bypass the U.S. to be the world's greatest economic power. And the challenge here really is much more in the U.S. than in China. Uh, back as I reported early when I came to private sector at MCC, Japan was the big challenge. And the fifth generation computing program funded by Midi was gonna take over the world. And the US woke up and ran faster and held on to its position. And that's the challenge now. Uh, if we wake up, and hopefully, hopefully we're in that process, and run faster and implementing the great array of emerging technologies, then the U.S. can remain the leading economy for the substantial future. Um, China probably can hold on to number two, but the challenge here, um, when she took over, he set out to have the Communist Party control everything, local, regional, national government, all the organizations. Then to control second term, all those state-owned enterprises. And late in the second term, he's moved to have the party play a substantial guiding role in the private sector. Private sector is where the innovation took place. So China's dramatic investment in pushing the frontiers of research and with very talented people um, says they can be at the right move side, paralleling the US, paralleling Europe in the emerging technologies. But if he persists in having the party control the private sector, I think he's going to lose the innovation race, the speed with which the technology gets turned into usable product services. You look at quantum computing, artificial intelligence, robotics, all kinds of things coming along that can alter, hopefully improve uh, the well-being of all our citizens in the process. So <clears throat> we simply have to stay in the race and run faster. And we're given a little bit of leeway here by the damping down of the areas that have led innovation in China for the last 40 years. 
Well, speaking of uh, speaking of innovation and emerging technologies, this is this is definitely something I, I wanted to bring up with you while I have time. Um, I know you keep yourself well informed on current events, so I imagine that you are aware of the fact that since 2017, there's been a fundamental shift in how quite a controversial issue is being addressed, and that's the issue of UFOs by the United States government. We've seen a, a gradual progression towards destigmatization and the dissemination of soft intelligence from within the Pentagon, within the Office of Naval Intelligence and the DoD on the subject of uh, UFOs, or what they now call UAPs. And and uh, this, of course, when I found out about it, captured my interest. I've since had the opportunity to interview Luis Elizondo, the former director of the Pentagon's now publicly acknowledged uh, UFO program that was revealed by the New York Times. I've uh, I've spoken with the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon, who said himself that the question is no longer if UFOs exist, the question is why are they here and who are they? So, it, like I said, it's a subject it's a subject that's captured the interest of Congress, the mainstream media, and the wider public for a few years now. And, and people want to know what's going on. And I, I suppose, given your previous positions within the intelligence community, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to uh, to ask you about this and and uh, and see what you could tell us about this, and if you've had any exposure to this issue. In my years active service, um, I became intrigued by the whole issue of UFOs, and. Um, as I dug into it, I found there were plausible explanations for virtually everything that we had observed. Uh, I was asked to uh, build a program much like this one, where they showed video at all and asked what it was. Four objects over Phoenix that disappeared. That was pretty easy. Four South Dakota National Guard airplanes down exercising on afterwards then executed the turn. Um, the others were, again, if you dug in, you could think Roswell, New Mexico, trying to find a way to get air samples of Soviet nuclear tests. That was before the U-2. So the idea of take high altitude balloons, put a lot of sensors on them, launch them in Canada, let the jet stream carry them through the area and then recover them back over Alaska. And a test at White Hands to see, White Sands, New Mexico, to see if they would work, first one, it crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. And for a couple of days, uh, not much reaction. Suddenly, panicked that the Russians were going to find, the Soviets were going to find out what we're up to. So scoop it all up and take it to Site 51 in Nevada. And thus, great UFO boom there. There was one of the videos down near the White Sands area, along the Texas-Mexico border. And I simply speculated, said, if I didn't know better, I would have thought you actually captured an image of a stealth missile being tested in the process. And I got a call from the Air Force asking me not to speculate on test science. Came to the private sector, 83. In 88, I was asked to join the board of, as a trustee of Caltech, uh, primarily because Caltech managed the Jet Propulsion Lab for NASA. And uh, and everybody who really knew Washington so I've been on that board now 32 years. Oversight of Jet Propulsion Laboratory. All the unmanned space explorations, looking for any evidence 
on sign of life. I have a high level of confidence that within our galaxy, there is no other living life. We continue to wonder, well, what about out in the other galaxies? What will the James Webb telescope let us see? Where do you want to go after Mars? Do you want to go interstellar? What's the, what's the biggest challenge of trying to do that? Propulsion. Even with our state-of-the-art uh, technologies broadly, we have to make some major breakthroughs to have any chance of doing interstellar. Now, is it possible that there are other civilizations out on other planets that are advanced beyond us and have solved the propulsion problems, I remain a great skeptic in the process. So I come back trying to understand what are the phenomena that have been observed that have caused the concerns. Inman's wild speculation is that those are long range drones being used by potential adversaries to surveil ongoing activity in the US and all, to collect information in the process and to take it back. Is it feasible to send drones halfway around the world to do images? The answer is yes. Right, but and it's, we're the, not it's the only country it's that the, has uh, it's confidence. The it's the performance capabilities and, and the flight characteristics that have been described, I think. I mean, the, the recent ones that have been coming up through the uh, the U.S. government, like the uh, the now famous Tic Tac uh, incident, which was a, uh, you know, it had no uh, flight surfaces, no wings, no exhaust, no air plumes, no sort of signatures to it. And it was making erratic movements in ways that couldn't really be described by our our physics. Go, go back and compare that, those evaluations. To the ones that were related to the over Phoenix, along the border, all the rest, um, phenomena we did not understand, and the observations did not automatically tell you what the answer could be. So I'm, I, there are clear things here to try to understand and explore, and particularly if we're being subjected to surveillance within this planet. Uh, for what purpose in the process. But for my JPL, I, mean, I remain highly confident that there are no other elements within our galaxy that could be providing those. And I'm very skeptical of interstellar unless it's something out there that's far advanced beyond where the U.S. is technology. I think if it existed we would have seen other evidence of it by this time. The James Webb will let us know a lot more about this yeah. over the yeah. next two or three years. Well, uh, maybe maybe you can just help me clarify something because when I was doing some background research on you, I, I came across a fascinating little segment from a documentary. It was a segment of an interview that you had in 1989 with a man called Bob Exler. Do you remember speaking to a man called Bob yes, Exler? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah and and. During, during this conversation, he asked you whether you believed that the recovered vehicles would ever be made available for technical research outside of the military circles. And, and your response to this was, 10 years ago, I would have said no, but whether time has evolved and they're beginning to become more open on it, it's a possibility. So um, obviously, correct me if I'm wrong, but it just seems like you're suggesting here that you're aware of retrieved UFOs being studied by the military. No, the answer was no, I would not, it would not. Absolutely, we're no retrieved UFOs. I have high confidence. A close confidant of George Bush and a man well acquainted with Area 51 was Admiral Bob Inman. His credentials are impeccable. He was director of both Naval Intelligence and the National Security Agency, as well as deputy director of the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA. In a telephone conversation with Bob Exler in 1989, 
he referred to recovered vehicles becoming available for research. Do, do you uh, anticipate that any of the recovered vehicles would ever be uh, become available for uh, technological research outside of the uh, military circles? Again, I honestly don't know. Uh, uh, ten years ago, the answer would have been no. Yeah. Uh, whether as time has evolved, they're beginning to become more open on it, is a possibility. It seems like you're suggesting here that you're aware of retrieved UFOs being studied by the military. No, the answer was no. I would not. There were not. Absolutely were no retrieved UFOs. I have high confidence that was not the case. Uh, hardware that ended up out of Site 51 was our own planned collection platforms that we didn't want Soviets to know about. Uh, happily, you two came along. Uh, we no longer needed to depend on balloons, high altitude, being floated by the jet stream to collect critical information we needed. What we didn't realize at stage that one of the U-2 flew at over 70,000 feet, altitude, it still could be brought down by long-range surface air missile, as Gary Francis Powers painfully discovered uh, on his flight from Pakistan to Norway. Um, so my speculation was was simply everything. Not that there were people already done, but quite in the future. That's why my remember 89 is when I began my JPL time. And my much deeper engagement in unmanned research of other planets in the system. Voyager, which has now already gone out into interstellar space, the two Voyager satellites. Um, the very thorough work at Saturn, at Jupiter, and others. So I'm much more confident now than I would have been in 89 that there are not other entities within our galaxy that could provide extraterrestrial research. Did One you question mark, you saw I've been cautious here in till we really understand interstellar and can look out and have a high level of confidence that there's not another even more advanced society out in other galaxies. Can we just absolutely say that makes sense? So the big challenge now is to go back and explore all of the phenomena that would explain what the pilots have seen in the more recent episodes. They're more complex. The ones I dealt with earlier, the, the uh, four jets over Phoenix at all, those were pretty simple to solve. Well, well, that's it. I mean, we now have like they they had the Aegis radar tracking this. It was on infrared through the Atflir pods on the F eighteen Strike Fighters, and you know, there's a lot of different data that's uh, suggesting that these are far more anomalous than simply a, a mischaracterized a mischaracterized Jay, mosaic explanation. Jay, let me remind you that you can observe things on radar, yeah, uh, and be absolutely inaccurate. Go back to the Gulf of Tonkin. They got us into the Vietnam War. On the August the 2nd, there were PT boats. On August the 4th, there were high waves and reflection off the top of those waves that led to an interpretation that there was a second PT boat attack. So we launched into the Gulf War, into the Vietnam War. And we later found out there were no PT boats out that second day. It was simply radar reflections of tops of waves and people in a uncertain panic condition presumed them to be PT boats. We know, knew later from captured uh, North Vietnamese PT boats. They were, they were there on the 4th, 2nd, they were not there on the 4th. So just another example that what you think you see on radar can turn out to be something entirely new. Mm. Did, did you ever cross paths with uh, Ben Rich, the former director of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, during your career? No. 
I no. don't know. Yeah, because well, he's uh, he made some interesting statements over the years. One of them, uh, interestingly, interestingly enough, was at a, a 1993 alumni speech at UCLA, where he was quoted to have said the following: "We already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects, and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine, we already know how to do." And that's coming from a director of the Skunk Works. Yeah, and what he's referring back to in those days with the SR seventy one. Well, really, he said he said, he said traveling among the stars, flying, already flying at two and a half times the speed of sound. While we were saying that building a supersonic aircraft would be too difficult to undertake, and we couldn't do that. So that was the technology that was classified in the black program that's in the late 80s, in the early 90s. Um, actually, in the late 70s, on into the 80s. Um, I come back to earlier in this conversation, focusing where should JPL go after Mars? Uh, we're going to be looking at Jupiter again and the moons around it. But I believe the focus ought to be on interstellar if we really want to be absolutely certain that there are not other planets out in other galaxies that support life as we find it here on Earth. And um, that's going to require major breakthroughs in propulsion to get us there. Now, the SR-71 was a major breakthrough in propulsion to get us two and a half times the speed of sound. It's going to take something a lot beyond that. Is it nuclear? Uh, I, I was worried at this point. Island, maybe. But all I know is there have got to be breakthroughs in propulsion to get us out of our galaxy and into others. While we're still alive, you're, you, you don't want to send off something that you're not going to know for 20 years what it observed, what it got. Our impotence, maybe we will end up doing that because uh, we can't do the propulsion to get out there faster. But the urge is going to be accelerate technology to be able to go explore other galaxies. Do you think that that kind of uh, leap in propulsion technology is possible within the next, let's say, 20 to 50 years? I do, yeah. yeah. Um, I look at the gains that have been made in, in other areas and get us where we are now. Um, frankly, I, I would simply point out to you that the cost of manned exploration is about 10 times the cost of unmanned exploration. Um, clearly, Neil Armstrong's uh, arrival on the moon was hugely impactful. Uh, Gagarin's earlier circle around the world was. Um, the, So we have to see where's going to be the impetus and the investment. And if you're really concerned about what's going on in other galaxies, you might be more interested in spending money on finding the technologies that will let you get interstellar as opposed to all it takes to get to the moon. Why is it 10 times more expensive? Because you want them to survive. They wanted to get back. And when you've got that consideration, it hugely drives up the cost. I will have made a number of those out of that exposition. But uh, on to your next question. Well, we're we're coming close to the end of the hour, so I won't I won't keep you for too much longer. But um just just I, I guess I just want to uh, be like crystal 
crystal clear on this because of the rank you have occupied within the intelligence community, because we've had over the recent years people coming out of the intel community, uh, like I said, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon, or the uh, the Pentagon Program Director for the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, Lou Elizondo. You've had these people come out and say, Yes, the U.S. government does know about UFOs. Yes, there is something going on here. And and I just want to make sure, you see, you're, you're saying that at no point during your career through the intel community were you given any sort of inclination that there is a, a credible situation with UFOs. Zero. That's, That's surprising. Clear, That's very, yeah, it's very, yeah, it's just very surprising, I suppose, just given what's been happening over the past few years. Yeah. There, there are there are unexplained phenomena around us every day. Rumsfeld was famous for his the knowns and the unknowns and the unknown unknowns in the process. So there, there are events that go on all the time that you don't understand. And the issue often is, are you prepared to allocate the resources to go explore? Um, for me, the issue here are the sensors that can be employed the next time somebody thinks they find they've got an unidentified flying object to more precisely, what is it? What are you observing? Um, we ought to be concerned about the development by adversaries of drones, that can go halfway around the world and keep some of our most sensitive activities under surveillance. For what purpose? For potential hostile use. Uh, we haven't talked in this conversation at all about pandemics, so many things, economic competition as well, then. and cyber, uh, cyber threats. When you're they're probing of the electric grid or probing of the air control systems. Is that a nation state looking for potential weaknesses that they could exploit uh, in the process? Or is it a potential terrorist uh, looking for a new way to create terrorists? So there are an awful lot of other challenges, unknowns, for us to explore that I believe are frankly more threatening than the idea of new one, one thing that I want to ask you um, before we before we wrap up here, because I think it's important, and uh, I'm wondering if I can get your perspective on this. Our innovations, our uh, our technologies, uh, as brilliant as many of them are, they are also out, outpacing our empathy, our compassion, our, could you say, spirituality. It would seem to me at least that we're a young species. We have plenty of growing up to do as a collective. Do you think that we need to find balance between um, science and spirituality or between innovation and empathy before technology drives us towards potential self-destruction? Rather than spirituality, I would raise the issue of ethics. Yeah, ethics. And we need to be alert and to track the ethical use of emerging technologies and to ensure that we don't accidentally facilitate the ability of unethical user application. And that's a, that's a live and ongoing challenge, whether it's breakthroughs in the splicing of genes, exploring what you can do in new ways to solve diseases, to uh, cloning humans. So on that cheerless note, uh, let me say that I think we need clearly to be focused on the ethical employment of emerging breakthroughs in technology which is going to confront us at the pace at which change is coming. 
Well, sir, I just want to uh, thank you and say it's been a it's been a unique privilege, and I really appreciate your time and, uh, of course, the many years of service to your country. And uh, I hope this has been an enjoyable experience for you. It's been uh, it's, it's certainly been insightful for me. Thank you, Jay. I uh, I clearly have not been helpful in your pursuit of unidentified flying objects uh, in the process, but hopefully you'll. Uh, Look carefully at what I have had to say. Well, and I uh, contemplate <laughs> if they really are out there. Why haven't we found any evidence on any other planet in this galaxy? Well, perhaps and coming over from the very... longer term, what we find limiting our ability to get out to interstellar. How could could that have been solved? in other societies and other planets? Uh, that's the big question. Good luck to you.